Welcome to lesson 19. We're going to talk about the signal chain. All the links in the audio chain from the time it leaves the source, goes in the computer, goes out, and into the listener's ears. There's all these links in the chain along the way that affect the sound. And we're going to talk about each and every one of them. Because you see, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I'm referring to the audio path as a chain because there's all these different connection points. If any one of them is broken, you'll get no audio. And any one of them can ruin the quality of your recording. You see, there's no point in having the world's greatest microphone if you got really noisy preamps. You need to scale the quality of each piece of gear along with the rest of your chain. Another thing I want to mention is generally, as a rule of thumb, that's your thumb, this isn't a hard and fast rule. Some people are going to disagree with me on this, and that's fine. They can go ahead and disagree, or let me know in the comments section if you disagree. I don't care. This is something that I find to be generally true. It's not even 100% true. But um, the order that the signal goes through in the chain is also generally the same order of importance for what's going to affect the sound quality the most. So the first link in the chain affects the sound quality the most. The second link in the chain affects the sound quality second most, third, fourth, so on. But then it kind of gets hazy. So the first link in the chain, numero uno, it's the source itself. Whatever it is that you're recording, be it an instrument, a vocalist, a piano, guitar, MIDI instrument, whatever. If that source doesn't sound good, your recording's not going to sound good. It's kind of a no-brainer. I hate to point out the obvious, but, um, you know, some people think they can capture a garbage-sounding source, have poor microphone placement, poor room acoustics, whatever it is, and fix it in post. They can add harmonics with their harmonics generator plug-in, or they can EQ it to make it sound better. No, fixing it in post is not the same as getting it right at the source. And as the recording engineer, it's your responsibility to make sure your recording sound good in the end. So you need to make sure the source sounds good. So if somebody else comes into your studio and for whatever reason they don't sound good, it's not your fault, but it's still your responsibility and you need to do everything you can to make them sound good. Let's say they have a poor quality guitar, it just sounds tinny and thrashy. Well, maybe you want to rent a guitar or have your own studio guitar. Same thing with miking a guitar amp. A lot of studios will have a collection of really high quality boutique tube amps. Because sometimes a client comes in and they got their garbage amp that they got at the pawn shop for five bucks and they think it sounds fantastic and you listen to it and it just sounds like garbage. But you need to make them sound good. So having an amp kicking around or renting something or having a friend with a really good amp, whatever. It's your responsibility to make the recording sound good. So you need to do whatever it takes to get a source that sounds good. Moving on to link in the chain number two is the room. I am a huge believer in the power of room acoustics. To me, it is, well, other than the source, it is the single most important part of getting a good recording. If everything else in your chain sucks, but you have good room acoustics, you can still get good quality recordings. If everything else in your chain is amazing, top-notch, world-class gear, but your room acoustics aren't good, sorry, there is no saving you. Your recordings won't sound good. I've heard so many people that have reasonably good recording equipment, but they're using a poor room and they just can't get the recordings to sound good. And they can't figure out why. Most of the time, it's poor room acoustics. The second most common thing is poor mixing and mastering. I'll get to that later. But room acoustics is the biggest factor that I've seen that ruins people's home recordings. So what is good room acoustics? What's bad room acoustics? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. People might disagree with me. I don't care if you disagree with me. I've done this a lot in a lot of different spaces. So this works. I can promise you. The bigger the room, the better. Remember that. Write that down. Get it tattooed on whatever part of your body you want to tattoo it to. I don't care, but just tattoo it somewhere. Tattoo it in your brain. You know what? Because you need to remember that. The bigger the room, the better. So there's this kind of a rumor floating around on the internet or somewhere. I don't know who started this to say that like the smaller the room, the better. And all these people are going in their closets or in like a little vocal booth or they buy those like little portable vocal booth things, um, the reflection filters. No, stay away from any of that stuff. It does not help. Bigger is better, not smaller is better. So stay out of your closet. Stay out of your uh, vocal booth. You know what works really well? is a living room. I've recorded in a lot of different living rooms and they're usually a, not a walled in room. They're open to the entire house, which creates an airspace that's bigger. It also creates a lot of diverse reflections. That helps as well. What you want to avoid is recording in a box. All of the sound waves just get bunched up. They reflect, they interact with each other. It causes comb filtering and it causes muddiness in the low end. You see, the problem with 
room acoustics isn't the high frequencies, it's the low frequencies. The low frequencies reflecting and interacting with each other causes muddiness. The high frequencies reflecting and interacting with each other actually causes ambience. It's desirable. Low frequencies are bad, high frequencies are good. So keeping that in mind, if you're stuck recording in a box, then you need room treatment. If you're in a big open space like a living room, you don't really need room treatment. But let's talk about room treatment a little bit. So if low frequencies are bad, then you want to concentrate on room treatment that absorbs the low frequencies. So bass traps of some kind. Typically low frequencies will gather in the corners. So we like to put bass traps in the corners because that's where they're most effective. Now you want absorption panels because you want to absorb the sound waves so that they don't reflect. And when you absorb the sound, you're basically making the room sound larger because there's going to be less reflections. Now the challenge with absorbing is it's more difficult to absorb low frequencies than it is to absorb high frequencies. But low frequencies are where it's at. That's what you want to concentrate on. So you need thicker panels with an air gap behind them made of an ideal material that absorbs low frequencies. Probably the best material in the world for this is Owens Corning 703 or Owens Corning 705. It's a rigid fiberglass insulation. You can buy the panels, cover them with fabric, stick them in the corners of your room, and that will improve it drastically. Most of the high-end acoustic panels that are really expensive to buy use that material. Now some people will say, well, if you can't afford proper room treatment, well, a little bit is better than nothing. You can just hang up some blankets or go in a room that's carpeted or put egg cartons on the wall. All of that is bad advice because you want to absorb low frequencies, not high frequencies. Something that's thin will only absorb high frequencies. If you hang a blanket from your ceiling, that's only going to absorb high frequencies, not low frequencies. And remember, high frequencies are desirable. So when you absorb them, that's going to dull in the sound. One of the worst things you could do for your room is studio foam. That stuff is useless. It looks good. I'll give it that much. But as far as room treatment and sound absorption, it's just foam and it's a thin layer. It's only going to absorb high frequencies. And it'll even have a noticeable impact that if you put enough of it in the room, when you walk into the room, you'll hear that the sound is deadened. But you're hearing it clearly because it's the higher frequencies that are deadened and our ears are a little bit more sensitive to high frequencies. So it'll jump out at us as a really well-treated room. But the fact is, it's not killing the low frequencies. The low frequencies are still going to be reflecting and still going to be interacting with each other. That room will just be a disaster to record in. All right, so we've covered the source. Sound leaves the source into the room. Sound travels through the room and into chain link number three, the microphone. Now there's about a million different microphones on the market and the audio engineer's job is to know which microphone to choose for which task. Kind of like how an artist needs to choose the right brush for the right stroke and the right style of painting that they're doing. Each microphone has its own unique, let's call it a personality. And the more you use various microphones, the more you get to know their unique personalities. They'll have different EQ curves. Some will be more prominent in the bass. Some may be more prominent in the treble. Maybe some of them will add compression. Some can handle super duper loud sources like high SPL. Others are designed more to be focused, to pick up sound in a certain direction. So there's a lot of different characteristics that these microphones can have. And I cover that in more detail in Lesson 21, which is all about microphones. So be nice to your microphones, because microphones are people too, you know. And the next link in the chain, after the signal enters the microphone, it travels down the XLR cable and into the preamp. So link in the chain number four is the preamp. But you might be thinking, well, why not the microphone cable? Isn't that a link in the chain? No, not really. Because the microphone cable has no effect on the sound quality. Yes, I've said it. I know. Again, the naysayers are going to be like, no, man, I can hear a difference. And you know what? No. No, there is no difference. Nobody can hear that difference. The only time you'll ever hear the difference between a good cable and a bad cable is if the cable is like super bad, if it doesn't have like a proper grounding or if it's got loose connections or if it's scratchy. Um, but like any half decent cable will have zero effect on the sound quality. Since we're talking about cables, I'll just talk about this really quickly. Like a good cable compared to a bad cable, a good cable will have a more sturdy connection. It'll last longer. And then there's the wiring itself, the thickness of the wires and how well they put a grounding shield around the two signal wires. A better quality cable, you can get away with longer cable runs and it'll last longer. But as far as like 10, 20 foot cable runs in your studio, zero impact on the sound quality. All right, got that out of my system. Preamps. 
What's the difference between a good preamp and a bad preamp? Well, a good preamp is going to be clean, it's going to retain the signal integrity, and it's going to sound nice. A bad preamp is going to be noisy. As you turn that gain knob up, it's going to be turning up this white noise along with it. It'll just sound like this hissing sound. It'll sound like this. So the gain knob on your interface, that's the gain of your preamp. But you can also buy standalone preamps and plug them into the line input of your interface. And these standalone preamps comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes with various bells and whistles. Sometimes they'll have a compressor, EQ, a de-esser built in. All of these are just extra fancy features on top of the preamp itself. The preamp itself is designed to amplify the signal. You see, the signal coming out of a microphone is really weak. It needs to get amplified. It needs to get boosted so that the next link in the chain called the converters, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but the converters need to see that signal at an optimal level so that you get the least amount of noise as the signal goes into the computer. So that's the job of the preamp. Give the signal a little bit of a boost as it moves on to the next link in our chain, conversion. ADDA conversion. Analog to digital, digital to analog. Well, what's that? So it's been analog this whole time from the source, to the microphone, down the cable, preamp. This is an analog waveform represented by voltage in the case of the preamp, but it's still analog. And then the converter converts that analog wave into zeros and ones that the computer can process. And that's the analog to digital converter. And on the way out of the computer, the digital to analog converter converts those zeros and ones that represent the sound wave into an analog waveform. I talk more about conversion in lesson 24. So once your signal is converted into zeros and ones, where does it go from there? It goes into your DAW. Ta-da! DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. And there's mixed definitions of this. It can be the entire studio, but generally when people are referring to the DAW, they mean what program, what software are you recording in? So there's like in the ballpark of a dozen different recording programs you can get that are well known. And each one has its own unique set of features. Most of them come with some kind of effects such as like reverb, EQ, compression. And when you instantiate those within the DAW, it's called a plugin. So if you bring in your EQ, you'd be bringing in an EQ plugin. Now let's say, for instance, you instantiate your EQ plugin and you put a 5 decibel boost at, whatever, 500 hertz, just to keep this simple. The same settings on different EQs will sound different, and different DAWs come with different EQs. They all use a different processing algorithm, and some of them operate at a different bit depth, and the bit depth also affects the sound quality. So not all EQs will sound the same with the same settings. Some sound better, some sound worse. And the same thing applies to compressors or any effects plugin at all. They all sound different. They all have their own unique characteristics. So some DAWs come with better quality plugins than others. And you can also purchase third-party plugins by like Waves, Sonics, and usually those third-party plugins will be better quality than what the DAW comes with. I mean, that's the whole point of the manufacturers making these plugins is they want it to be offered as an upgrade to whatever you're using that the DAW comes with. Also, different DAWs will have different tools available for editing the audio, such as loop recording, quick swipe comping, live looping, beat detection, tempo mapping, group editing. Also, some DAWs come with software instruments and some DAWs come with lots of software instruments. Some DAWs don't come with any at all. And some DAWs, such as Logic, come with a pile of extra sounds, such as loops and sound effects. And you can insert these into your project. And then once you have your song all produced, you've got it recording, you've got all these different tracks, the next link in the audio chain is the summing. This is an often overlooked part of the audio chain because when you just start working on music, it happens automatically in the background. You're not really aware of what's going on behind the scenes. You just hit the play button and your DAW plays all the tracks simultaneously. But what's happening is it's converging all of those tracks together into a single track that's stereo left and right. And the way it does that is through a mathematical algorithm. It's adding the waves together. This wave plus that wave equals that wave. So what's wrong with that, you might ask? Well, it's prone to mathematical errors. Let me give you an example. What's 10 divided by 3? It's 3.3333333. The threes go on forever, literally infinite. It's impossible for the computer to recognize an infinite value. So after a certain number of decimal points, it has to round it off. And that's where your bit depth come in. A higher bit depth means it's rounding it off with more decimal points, really, more accuracy. But even at a higher bit depth, it's still not perfect. And when you're summing multiple tracks together, like an entire song, an entire project, this does make a noticeable difference in the audio quality. Well, what choice do I have, you might ask? Hmm. And this is where analog summing comes in, also known as out-of-the-box summing. Digital summing is called in-the-box, analog summing is called 
out of the box. So with analog summing, you have an interface that has enough outputs that you can play all the different tracks from your song on their own output of the interface. So each track is played on its own individual output of the interface and it's plugged into a mixer. So you know when you look at a picture of like these big studios and they have this giant mixing desk? That's what it's for. Each track in the DAW is plugged into its own track in the mixer and the mixing engineer can set the levels, adjust the EQ, whatever controls he has on the mixing board, and then the song is being output from the left and right output of the mixing board. And then they take that output from the mixing board and record it back into the DAW. Another way that some studios do analog summing is to incorporate a line summer. As opposed to a big mixing desk, this is just a box that sits in your rack, and all it does is it converges all of those audio tracks together into a single track for left and right. But it does it in the analog domain, as opposed to the computer doing it in the digital domain. Now the advantage of analog summing is, as you sum these tracks together, there are no mathematical imperfections. The values are infinite. And therefore you get the precise sound that you should get from converging all those tracks together. The downside to analog summing is you're running the audio through a whole bunch of links in an analog sound chain, and each of those links will add a small amount of noise. So with analog summing, your signal to noise ratio might be a little bit lower. So there's a trade-off. So is one better than the other? Hmm, depends who you ask. There's professionals in the industry who swear by analog summing, and there's professionals who swear by digital summing. If you research it online, the most common theme that you'll hear people saying is they don't hear any difference at all. As for me personally, I'd say there is a significant difference. I use a line summer, and I love what it does. Another disadvantage of analog summing is the cost. You need a more expensive interface that has enough outputs, and you also need the summing device, whether it's a mixing board or a line summer, and that can be quite expensive. And if you're going to do analog summing, it's pointless to do it with low quality gear because it'll add too much noise and you're not going to have any advantage at all over digital summing. I go into more detail on summing in lesson 29 and I'll even give you some examples so that you can hear for yourself what the differences are. Link in the chain number eight. Eight. That's eight there. It's your monitors. It's the medium you use to hear back whatever the project is that you're working on. Remember how I said earlier that the order of importance of each link in the chain is also similar to the order that it travels in from the source to the microphone to the preamps. Well, chain link number eight, your monitors are a bit of an exception to that rule. They're super important. If you can't hear it, you can't fix it. But it depends what you're doing in your studio on how important your monitors are. So if you're only recording and you're not doing any mixing and mastering, you're sending it off to another studio for that, well then your monitors aren't really that important. You can get away with a decent set of headphones. You just need to be able to hear what you've captured and make sure you captured it properly. But if you're doing your own mixing and mastering, you need good monitors. I compare it to driving a car down the road. If your windshield all of a sudden fogs up, you can't see nothing and you won't be able to make accurate decisions on how to steer the vehicle. Well, your monitors, if they're not clear, you're not gonna make accurate decisions on how to adjust and edit the audio. I noticed a huge difference in the quality of my mixes when I upgraded from a fairly low quality monitor to a high quality monitor. But the difference that I noticed isn't what I expected. The time that it took me to mix a song was greatly reduced, like less than half. And that's because all of a sudden I could hear all these little things that are causing problems. I could hear them with more accuracy and I would know exactly what I need to do to fix it. If your monitors are muddy in the mid-range, well then your mix could be muddy in the mid-range and it's not gonna reveal it. Same with high frequencies. If your monitors don't have clarity in the high frequencies, quite often I like to boost the high frequencies in vocals and there's a sweet spot where you can get it just right. But if the high frequencies in your monitors are trashy or just dull or just not there, you're not gonna get an accurate boost on whether it's vocals or guitar or whatever. Typically with monitors, the outcome of your mixes will have the opposite EQ curve of your monitors. So if your monitors are bass heavy, well as you're mixing, you're not gonna put in as much bass to make it sound good. And then your final mix doesn't have much bass. If your monitors have a ton of treble as you're mixing, you're not gonna put in as much treble because it's already there, right? And then your final song doesn't have much treble. Same thing goes with the opposite. Let's say your monitors roll off the treble. Well, as you're mixing, you're gonna be like, oh, that needs more treble. You'll put a little more treble in and then your mixes are too bright. Studio monitors can have lots of different designs and features. For instance, a two-way will have a tweeter and a woofer. A three-way will have a tweeter, a mid-range, and a woofer. Some speakers will have a bass port, some won't. A bass port will give more volume to the bass frequencies, but it's not clean volume, it's not a clean sound. But sometimes more is better, sometimes it isn't. If they don't have a port, then they'll be in a sealed enclosure, and you tend to get a cleaner, more accurate sound reproduction from that, 
but you don't get as much volume from the bass. So there's a trade-off there. Also, you might want to incorporate a subwoofer. You might not want to incorporate a subwoofer, pros and cons. I get into it more in a later lesson about monitors. And then also I'll just touch on most studio monitors have their own amplifier that's built in. So you have to plug them into the power from the wall and you also plug in your signal and it'll amplify the signal and send it to the speakers. And the last link in the chain, ugh, finally, is the room. The room. But Chris, you already mentioned the room. It was chain link number two. Yeah, I know, that wasn't that long ago. I was there. But when you're listening back, the sound comes out of the speakers and into the room again. So the room affects the sound again. Also, the room affects the sound differently in the mixing and mastering stage than it does in the recording stage. Remember in the recording stage, I said high frequency reflections are desirable. You know, a little bit of reverb there, it's nice. But in the mixing and mastering stage, you don't want reverb. Ideally, you don't want any reflections at all. You want a more dead space because those reflections are gonna cover up and mask certain things in the audio. So you won't hear the compressor kicking in with as much detail. Or if you're adding some treble with an EQ, well, maybe the room has already added some treble. So you're not getting an accurate perspective. One of the biggest things that I know a lot of people struggle with is if there's reverb in the room, then while you're doing your mix and you're adding reverb to a part, you're not going to hear the reverb you're adding until you add more reverb than what the room is already adding. So you'll be in your mix and you'll be like dialing up the reverb, dialing up the reverb, and you'll be like, oh, it's, it's at the point where I should be able to hear it by now, but you can't hear it. And then you start dialing it up more and then, oh, okay, there we go there. Now I can all of a sudden hear the reverb. So that's when you've surpassed the point of how much reverb the room is adding and you're adding more. And then you go listen to that mix somewhere else, like in a car or on a headphones like the next day or something like that and you're just like oh my god it's drowning in reverb what was i thinking it's because the room is masking the reverb and if you remember earlier when i was talking about room acoustics i said bass tends to accumulate in the corners well there's also various spots in the room that'll have a different eq response so there might be some other positions sporadically located throughout the room that have more bass or more or less of a certain frequency and depending where you're sitting, you might not be hearing an accurate frequency response. And again, that's going to give you the opposite effect on your mixes. So if it's boosting the mids on your mix, you're going to be cutting the mids a little bit to make up for that. But it doesn't really boost or cut certain frequencies. It'd be more accurate to say that it's causing what's called comb filtering. And that's not something that can be fixed with an EQ or with room correction. A lot of these monitors, they'll come with a little microphone and they'll say, oh, you can correct whatever imperfections are in your room through the software. Yeah, maybe it helps a little bit, but it's not a solution. There's nothing you can do to reverse the comb filtering that's taking place. So that's it. We've covered all the various links in the audio path. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please hit that like button, the thumbs up right down there. Smash it for me. Click. And also, if you're interested in the entire audio engineering course from start to finish, everything you need to know, I'm posting it on YouTube. So subscribe to this channel and you'll get all of that completely for free. Thanks for watching and have a great day.